Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Time for Lunch is a new podcast from HRN for curious young eaters, where we focus on the serious questions. Aren't chickens tiny dinosaurs? We get to know our favorite foods in unexpected ways. We just like cheered like you would cheer for your classmate when they're round in second base in softball. And we just like, peach, 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 peach. Yay, thank you, peaches. Learn some new recipes and jokes. What does a boxer's mom put in his lunch? A knuckle sandwich. And load up on fun facts. Experts estimate that there are between one and 2,000 types of insects eaten around the world. So roll up your sleeves and dig in. Subscribe to Time for Lunch on your favorite podcast app so that you and your favorite young eater can catch up on the whole first season. New episodes of season two out each week. This episode is brought to you by Brooklyn Ball Factory a Japanese eatery and coffee shop at 95 Montrose Avenue in East Williamsburg. Learn more at brooklynballfactory.com. Hello, welcome to Japan Needs. I'm your host, Aki Kwatema, food writer and director of the New York Japanese Culinary Academy, which promotes a deep understanding of Japanese cuisine in America. We normally broadcast live from a studio at Roberts in Bushwick, Brooklyn, but our studio is currently closed due to the outbreak of coronavirus, as everywhere else in the world. So we are recording this episode remotely from my apartment in Brooklyn. So uh, this show is all about Japanese food and food culture. We see sushi at every daily in the supermarket, but what is beyond sushi? We hear dashi, ramen, and izakaya, but what exactly are they? Japanese food is still a mystery for many people, and I try to demystify it in this program with my cool guests. And my guest today is Maribeth Boyler, who is a chef with impressive experiences. She worked under some of the greatest chefs in the world, like Michelle Wu in London, John Joel Bung Lichten in New York, and she served as a private chef for the U.S. Ambassador Caroline Kennedy from 12, 2013 to 2017 in Tokyo. And she continues to cook in Japan since then. So today we'll discuss challenges my best came across while she was working as a chef for the American Ambassador to Japan, why she decided to stay in Japan when, uh, when the job was completed, and what's special about Japanese culture for her, and much, much more. But before you start, Japan is available on the Heritage Radio Network website as well as on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify as a podcast. So please go to iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify and subscribe to Japan Needs. And please write to our review. We really appreciate your feedback. Also, if you have any comments or requests for show topics or guests, please let us know. You can email us at japanneeds at theheritageradionetwork.org or kikokatema.com. Now let's start a conversation with Maribeth Boyer. Hello, Marius. Welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you? Very good. And uh, so sorry that we had to ask you to stay up late because you're calling in from Japan. So oh, that's okay. <laughs> I, I'm usually up this. I'm usually up this late. I'm just not usually 
um, having an interview this late. <laughs> That's the only difference. I wouldn't be asleep. I just wouldn't be talking to somebody in New York. <laughs> All right. So, so I have many questions for you. So first of all, uh, where are you from? And uh, what did you eat when you grew up? I was born, I'm born and raised in New York. Um, born on 12th Street between 5th and 6th. Oh my God. Uh, my dad was actually a doctor at St. Vincent's Hospital in the West Village. Um, so born and raised in New York, I kind of always gravitate. I, I would leave and then come back to New York. Um, I went to college in Rhode Island. I worked in London and a couple of uh, locations in France and New Mexico, but I would always come back to New York. So New York is is... Uh, my home, although Tokyo is my home, I'm definitely a New Yorker at in heart. Mm. <laughs> um, and I ate very, very well. Uh, I'm the youngest of seven, a uh, really great family. I'm super close. Um, we ate pretty basic. I mean, it was a big, fa- you know, big family. There was nine of us. Um, so it was not always the most adventurous, but very kind of basic the the protein the starch the veg um and by the time i rolled into high school my siblings because a bit, like i said i'm the youngest um everybody started leaving going to college and then not returning or some would return and go to law school or you know staying in the house but um by the time i hit high school there was more freedom to go out to, we, we ate out quite a bit actually. So, um, I was really fortunate. <laughs> mm, wow. So it sounds like you had a basic, uh, balanced, um, home, cook, home cooking and also you discovered all those New York city dining scenes. So sounds perfect. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah, I mean, perfect. I don't know. I mean, it wasn't always the healthiest, uh, you know, seventies, eighties, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was. I certainly can't complain. We we were we were well fed, and I was very fortunate to have been exposed at an early age to some pretty great restaurants, either through my parents or through aunts who um, would take me to you know Four Seasons and the Sherry Netherlands, like really cool kind of wow. places. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it was kind of fun as a little as a little girl. Mm. I was obsessed with. Julia Child and um, asked for a waffle iron from Santa. So I was kind of a freak. I mean, I was really into food. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, so uh, but why exactly, you know, you decided going to uh, um, pursue a culinary career? A culinary career? Um, I, I always, I just always really gravitated towards cooking. I mean, I I started making cookies when I was little and kind of morphed into helping my mom and then helping my aunts cook. And um, like I said, I was really into Julia Child and I, my parents used to buy me her, her cookbooks and I used to watch it on TV, um, her show. And I knew that I wanted to do that, but I wasn't 100% sure when I was in high school. I was 16 when I went to college. I was pretty young. Um so I went to, uh, I, I have my degree in business. I went to Providence College and I studied, uh, I have a, you know, a business management degree because I wasn't 100% sure about uh, the culinary field. And I, and I felt like, well, it's a good idea to go get college under my belt. And then when I get out, if I'm serious, I'll pursue it, which is exactly what I did. So when I got out of school, I, that's when I... Um, met Jean-Georges von Gerichten and started working with, he hired me. I, I had never, I had no uh, restaurant experience at all, <clears throat> but he hired me and I started working with him. Wow. So you, you had some personal connect, connection with uh, Jean-Georges or? Uh, not re- I mean, like th- through uh, a man named Mark Sarazan, who was a really uh, amazing guy who owned a, a meat, uh, he owned a bag in Spittler, which was a meat vendor. And he was kind of like the chef broker in a way. And this is, this was, this was late. This was 
you know, like 80, late 80s, 90s. Mm. So he uh, just through like a indirect friend, that kind of a thing of uh, my my father's physician who also worked with my father. Wow. <laughs> so it's like friend of a friend right. kind of a thing. Thank yeah. Really so it felt like another French guy, French guy who knew Jean George. Jean George had just uh, opened up Lafayette or was just uh, at the Drake Hotel. And so he connected me to him and he hired me right away. And Right. Well, it sounds like yeah. it's not just, you know, you had a good connection, but it's hard to prove that you're so good. You know, it's John George. Anyways, so it's very impressive. Mm. Yeah. Well, I wasn't so good. I would, didn't, wasn't any, you know, I was just very eager to learn and I think really enthusiastic. And I think that's why he hired me. And then, you know, I mean, doors open sometimes easily, but they shut even easier. So, yeah, I mean, if, if you, uh, connections are great, but they only go so far. Right. <laughs> if you're, if you don't put, if you don't put, the actions behind right. it. And you so, worked also um, at, uh, you know, the John George with John George, who's a French chef, and uh, the Michel, mm. uh, Michel Wu in London. And yeah. yeah, and I heard also you worked at the Rue Gavroche in London, and I think we, the top restaurants. So what did you learn from the, those experiences? Uh, well, I mean, I, I feel like you could learn something everywhere if your eyes are open or if you and if you're open to that uh the Jean George that again that was my first was my first um who's my first chef he was an amazing guy and he was an amazing mentor um worked with wonderful people on the line I mean I was a little kid I was a kid and um the people that were on the line were really tremendous. And I, I had the advantage of go, I went to night school uh, three nights a week and then I would come in, worked full time for him and ask a million questions and tell them what I learned. And then they would tell me, Oh no, that's really stupid. Don't do it this way. Do it this way. You know? (laughs) So it was kind of like, so I don't know between the two, it seems like something I learned something. Right. And so the Um, night school was at the international culinary center in, uh, in Soho, right? Yeah. Well, it was the French culinary Institute. Now it's the ice or yeah, the culinary. Yeah. Yeah. They change, it's changed names. So it's a, it's a, it was a good school. Um, and this way I was able to work full time with him. So he, he kind of convinced me to change my, my original plan was to go to the Culinary Institute of America and he convinced me not to do that so I could stay with him. <laughs> so that, I mean, it, that was a great experience. And then I, then because I was working on the line with these really awesome older guys, um, I knew I wasn't going to ever, run the station so so to speak so I told him I was bored I you know I just said I, I'm not I can't go anywhere with this so he sent me to France to where he had done his apprenticeship at the Auberge de Lille which is three-star Michelin and um, I worked there and I lived with his family on weekends and um, and then he then I worked at the Hotel Martinez in Cannes uh, so yeah, he was awesome. So he helped facilitate those positions, and he was really supportive in in um, in me learning from other people too, not just kind of holding me near and dear to him, mm. so to speak. You know, because I think that that's a that's a that's a huge thing. I mean, I feel like you can learn uh, from anybody. And it, it was really important to, um, to train with a variety, with a few people, right? because you learn, even if you know, even if you learn that you don't want to do it one way or the other, you know? So, and the Rue brothers were the, the, uh, Michelle Rue was, it was Albert was the father and Michelle was the son. And this, this is Le Gavroche. And it was intense. It was the, yeah, it was brutal. We, we worked 85 hours a week in five days. Wow. Yeah, but it was awesome. Mm. I mean, it was amazing work, um, incredible pressure, but beautiful, beautiful restaurant, beautiful food, perfect food, perfectly cooked. Mm. Um, you really learned a lot and you learned a lot about yourself and your strengths, weaknesses. And um, you even, I mean, you even learned how you 
wanted to treat people or how you didn't want to treat people. Mm, that's huge. You know, it was tough. Right. Yeah, it was tough. Right. Yeah, it was really and tough. at this point, uh, Okay. Thanks. So uh, maybe you can just uh, uh, repeat the, the important thing uh, you said about uh, learning from other people. Like not to, do, oh, not to do. Well, no, I just said that it's, uh, I have found, and particularly uh, if you talk about Le Gavroche, um, that you can, you learn about yourself, you learn about your strengths, you learn about your, obviously your cooking abilities, but you're also, that kind of place was a sink or sw literally like sink or swim or survival of the fittest. It was a very strange place, um, but a great place. And uh, you learned more than cooking a lot about yourself and your strengths, weaknesses, and your ability to deal with your coworkers and help and support, and also to how to treat people, whether you agree with the way uh, the kitchen was run or the treatment or, or not, you know, it's kind of your, I, I think I, I got a lot, I got a lot mm. out of that. And I've, I'm lifelong friends mm. that were on the line were pretty amazing. Wow. But it's almost like uh, in the military or something like you really was. Oh, it was totally. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was really crazy. It really was kind of crazy. I mean, I can write a book just about Maybe that. Maybe you um, should. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then you worked as the executive chef at the legendary dining destination, uh, BG at the Burger Doll. Goodman in New York, uh, which is an upscale, highly sophisticated department store. So what kind of, I mean, you now, you moved on. And how did it happen also? What kind of menu did you offer in what kind of style of cooking? Uh, at Bergdorf, Bergdorf, I went there after I had done catering. I was an executive chef at Great Performances, which is a huge catering company in, in New York. And, and then I also had my own catering company. And they had, um, I was approached by a friend who knew that they were uh, looking for somebody at Bergdorf, and I figured that would be an interesting change. So I uh, I started with them, and it was really fun. Um, I had never done that kind of a, I'd never worked in that type of restaurant. I mean, they have, um, I ran their three restaurants, and it's really it was, obviously it's a gorgeous it was a gorgeous restaurant, um, and they're very concerned about health. You know, health conscious. Uh, a lot of late meals. We had to do a number of them that were five hundred calories and below. Um, it wasn't so very different from what I've. I previously had cooked or my style, it was kind of, I was fortunate enough to be able to cook my style of food, which was, which was very seasonal and locally sourced. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, um, okay. So just because we have a lot more questions, I, I just wanted to yeah. uh, make sure that so yeah. you, after you left the John George and then uh -huh. studied in France and then eventually you studied your catering business. And then you are yeah. invited to become the chef. And, and it's, right. it's interesting that now you're the executive chef and managing three restaurants. So based on what you learned, you are you are now the team leader. And it sounds like you've been building your career, even at the point, very uh, solidly and surely. And then you got, um, in 2014, you left New York yeah. to accept the offer to mm -hmm. serve as executive chef and events planner of the U.S. Embassy residence in Japan under Ambassador right. Caroline Kennedy. So right. how did it happen? I, I, she had been my client for, at that point, about 15 years. Wow. Um, yeah, I had spent every summer in Martha's Vineyard cooking for... Um, Ambassador Kennedy and her fam uh, Ed and the fa her family. Um, I can't remember when it started, but it was at that point. It at right now it's about twenty years. So it's uh, we met each other. I was hired as their private chef for 
one summer and we really hit it off and it kind of morphed into a great long-term relationship where I then uh, in my spare time would cook dinners for them and then their private events and then their uh, corporate events. Um, It just kind of morphed into a great, very close relationship. And when she was when she had accepted her position in uh, Tokyo, we talked about me maybe going over and it was <clears throat> decided that she would go over and see what the position was like. You know, I, I said that I was very interested in moving over, but it would have to be, you know, the right circumstance. If it was good for me, if it was good for Ambassador Kennedy, if it was good for the embassy, then we should have a a further dialogue. So she went off and moved to Tokyo and it took about three months. And then she called me and asked me if I would move. Wow. Um, (laughs) That's exciting. Yeah. 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 She's like, please move over here. Yeah. Um, so I did. And I was, I, it took a while, uh, So that was, I don't know, that was probably the winter of 2014. And it's not, you can't just up and move. It's, there's a process. So there was um, a lot of things that you have to do through, through the embassy and check, you know, security checks and so forth. But I ended up moving uh, October, 2014. And I was super excited. I mean, I was happy in New York, but um, I felt Number one, I love her dearly, um, and so that. But I knew that she would not be kind of throwing me under the bus. <laughs> like that, it had to have been. It had to be a great place, and she she was so excited for me to join her here um, that it was just sounded. It was just all good, and I also felt that it was a there was a time limit. So I knew that she would only be here for two years or so max. Uh, So it didn't seem like a difficult decision. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it really wasn't until I I didn't expect to be here as long as I have been really. So So, so, um, did you have any um, culture shock or language barrier at the beginning? Um, I don't, I don't think culture shock. I mean, I, I like to travel and I think that it was, uh, I was never, I'm, I'm not intimidated. I don't get intimidated by, you know, I never thought, oh, this is big and scary. You know, I mean, I'm from New York, so it's not, I always think it's very similar to New York, except that you can't read anything here, <laughs> um, <laughs> or understand anything. But, um, so I kind of thought of it as fun, interesting adventure. And particularly because I was so close to her, um, that I was very, I'm very, very confident that it it was nothing, nothing intimidating, all good, really all good. I think that the, obviously there's a different culture. And I think that there were adjustments for sure. I mean, I I feel like there is, um, the pace is much slower, the pace of of business is much slower or movement in general um, took a little while to get used to. I don't even know if I'm still used. I'm still really not used to it, <laughs> to be honest with you. Who am I kidding? It drives me crazy. Um, but but um, the, and the language, of course, it's really hard. I'm, I am taking, le- I'll have to take lessons for the rest of my life. I still take them. I have a lesson on Thursday, um, but I didn't, I think that if you let that be a huge bummer or scary, then it will be. If you just decide, okay, this is going to be a challenge, but you can deal with it. And I'm not going to let it stop me from anything. Then it's okay. You kind of, you figure out ways to navigate it. I did a ton of, a lot of traveling by myself and I would just bring, you know, be prepared, um, know what you're doing or have a plan, have a little cheat sheet of, you know, certain things that you may need to be able to, you know, have to ask or things written in Japanese that you might want to pull out of your pocket and ask, you know, (laughs) if you, if you didn't feel confident enough to say it. So um, I never had, a, I never really had a problem. Mm, Yeah. I think that's the, the yeah, I mean, the heart, if you see it as a kind of challenge that you can grow out of, 
then there's nothing so hard in a way. I think it seems like you're enjoying those challenges. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the, the obvious challenges are the in cooking um, with sauces and things of that nature. Like it's not... I, I'm not intimidated to go to markets and things like. Of course, I mean I know what a good fish looks like. I, I know vegetable, you know that kind of a thing. Did the, I think the l- layer of difficulty in food would would really be more going to grocery stores and looking at you know twenty bottles of brown <laughs> sauce. That just, how the hell do you figure out what that is? And honestly, I was so lucky because I was working for this amazing woman who said, okay, well, buy it, buy a bunch of them and just figure it out, you know, <laughs> and literally. So that's what I would do. I, I, for not, you know, it's not like I did, I didn't go in and buy a hundred bottles of different soy sauces and things, but I would just experiment. And then you figure out what you like and what works and um and I think that's kind of steered the way I cook now because I don't nobody told me how to cook with any of this stuff right I never really took I mean I took a couple of little Japanese lessons but um I kind of found some of them really boring because they were very basic but if nobody's ever told you what certain things are for and you've just opened up the bottle and you've tasted them then you'll put those things with things that you think they work with, not with what the rules are telling you. Mm, right. And then all those, you know, challenges you were facing and at the embassy in Tokyo, so you were in charge of planning mm. and designing both large events and intimate gatherings and that reflected mm. the multifaceted relationship between the United States and Japan. And that sounds very uh, kind of almost overwhelming. So what is the most difficult part of the job and how did you manage that? Um, it wasn't, it's, it does sound overwhelming and it wasn't. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was, I came from very big experience. See, that's what I think. I think that, you know, I, I, when I was the, I was the executive chef at Great Performances, we would do part, we could do 20 parties a day. And one of them could have been the opening for the you know, Philharmonic and the Met and this and that, you know, it's like, so thousands, I'm used to cooking for thousands. So it was more, um, I think the challenge was much more, it's not that it was an easy job, but I think the biggest challenge or hurdles were um, getting locals to accept change. Mm, Right. I think it's a. I think sometimes that's uh, new things are seen as intimidating, so not so eager sometimes. And but that that's a little bit of a generalization. But uh, there was definitely some of some people that were very stuck in their ways and not really interested in seeing some new and different. But are you talking that about wasn't really... your uh, co chef, like team members? No, I think just in general, like the, the the style of, say, the style of events or they were kind of old fashioned to me and certainly to, you know, Ambassador Kennedy brought me over because she was, she wanted to have things that were her style and uh, something that was fresh and new and exciting and cool and that wasn't really happening there. So it was that's the biggest challenge was to introduce people to things that they weren't necessarily um, familiar with. And yes, I'm talking about the people that I worked with there, mm. um, the locals, right. not, I mean, obviously the audience, the people that were the guests, they were psyched, right. you know? but um, so it was just, it's just, and it, it wasn't like it was some crazy large challenge i think once people realized that um change is good then slowly slowly they would yeah i think in japanese uh, mindset it's it's hard to change something because yeah as you said things move slowly because everybody agrees on something so if you want to change everything everything has to it's like a chain reaction um but um it sounds like that the Probably the reason that 
you know, the old ambassadors bring their own private chefs is to educate the cultural style mindset through food as mm. well. So I think you did a very meaningful job over there. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I actually was the old, I was the first one that that has ever been brought over. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. I don't know whether that's good or bad. But, it is great. Um, no. Yeah. yeah. I know. And uh, so, so what was some, maybe you can give us a, an example of most memorable event that you worked on for um, the campus community? Um, well, there was there were a lot of great ones. There are we. One of them, let's say, there was a, a one for five or six hundred for uh, the JFK symposium and Bill Bill Clinton spoke and he attended. So that was kind of a big deal. That was also a fell on St. Patrick's Day, which Ambassador Kennedy, it's a big day for Carolina. Right. <laughs> so everything everything had to be green. It was like uh, it was pretty funny. Um <laughs> but that was that was kind of a neat one. And then another one that was really fun was for the uh, governor of Kentucky. Ambassador Kennedy had the idea to um surprise him by bringing in miniature ponies she had met when she was in dc for a conference she met a japanese woman who owned two miniature ponies that ha lived in an apartment in tokyo <laughs> only in tokyo okay i'm not serious i am totally serious they lived in, in an apartment in tokyo so i met them i met the ponies <laughs> went to their apartment and had little coats of roses created with a local far, um, florist so that it mimicked the Kentucky Derby. Oh. <laughs> I'll send you these pictures. It's really hard to explain, right. but it was and hilarious. And people, <laughs> people were so shocked. And we brought, I mean, Ambassador Kennedy brought them into the building oh, and it was wow. just really funny um yeah it was kind of it was fun i'll send you the pictures because they really were okay it was fun. i look forward to it um, um yeah yeah and then i heard that you um you fostered what you call food diplomacy through relationships with local vendors and food sources and your contacts with you as affiliated restaurants and vendors so could you mm -hmm. elaborate on it sure uh, again, this was something that I don't know how strong that um, that was pushed with previous ambassadors, but it was really important for Ambassador Kennedy and, and for me. And um, particularly for there is one event a year. It's the Fourth of July event. So it's usually for about 1600 people. And previously, it would just be all about American products. So it would be, you know, McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken. or And I, I, I felt, we both felt like this is not, is that really what we want to do here? And I, it wasn't what I wanted. Well, I'll answer that. No, it wasn't what I wanted to do. So uh, it, we switched it up. So I, we the focus was American products, U.S. products with local vendors. In other words, um, a local uh, taco guy. We supplied him. We asked him if he wanted to participate. And so he produced his burritos in the same way that he would normally do it. But we provided U.S. pork, U.S. cheese, U.S. sour cream. So it was a partnership type mm. thing. Um, local soba producers, we provided buckwheat from North Dakota so that they could create their same traditional method. So it's not like we were saying, here, use this crummy product, really good product that they were able to showcase their wonderful food products. But using a Japanese, I'm using an American um, ingredients. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So it's almost like uh, for food, for good food to be deepened and expanded for its opportunities rather than just nationalize where it should be from. Yeah. Well, I think that it was, I mean, for that, for that, for this 
yearly event, it, it works really well. I mean, it's all about, you know, independence and, um, or, the, you know, the 4th of July, you're working, you're, you're, we're here in Tokyo, uh, we love our Japanese neighbors, what better way than to take American products, which, which, because it's the US embassy, you're supposed to be showcasing, but not just throwing American products in everybody's face, but taking those products and working with local small Japanese producers who could frankly could you it's almost like good PR yeah. you know so these people were able to um, show their products to uh, uh, an audience of 1600 people who otherwise would not have seen them right yeah I, uh, so. I think it's real cultural uh, exchange and I see for example um, there are sake producers in the States using American-born mm-hmm. native uh, colors, right? Which mm-hmm. really is really tasty. So, yeah, that kind yeah. of thing is really meaningful. And, uh, yeah, that sounds wonderful. Um, so, to you, well, you mentioned a couple of things about Japanese systems. And so what's unique about Japanese food system? Uh, I mean, Japanese food is just great. I think that it's, uh, for me, there's so many things to learn, you know. Um, I feel like it's just never ending, the amount of things that I can learn here. Uh, But I think, and I think that there's such a deep respect for food. I feel like, like no, no other country, people just love their food like people it's almost like an extension of their family it's kind of it's a little borderline bizarre (laughs) but you know like uh the way somebody might speak about their mekon or their oranges if they're from kyushu or you know you really think that they're talking about their uncle but it's an orange (laughs) you know it's there's this bond i've i had never i've never really experienced anything like that and i've lived in in very food uh centered countries but um yeah i mean there's just i think it's just the the a deeper respect for food food is food is everything here right yeah and i think uh sense. the mindset of from farm to table or seat to table has mm-hmm. been always there in japan so yeah it's kind of like vertical the distribution system is really not commercial but it's more spiritually connected like you described yeah right okay and uh, so you have very rich global culinary experiences like you said and so france and uk and new york and of course in japan so how do you call your style of cooking at this point of your life and uh, what is your culinary philosophy uh my style is I don't think it's, it hasn't really changed. It's very, you know, I cook local, locally sourced food. I cook seasonal. I cook, I think, I think it's simple, though when I say it's simple, a lot of people think I'm crazy. Um, maybe it's not so simple, but I think it's relatively simple. Um, not a lot of manipulating or playing with food. Um, I think that it's kind of more, it's morphed a bit here in a way, because I do use a lot of different Japanese products in a Western way. Um, I don't really, I think that the, what I have found here, what I've learned here is that Japanese cooking and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, many people just follow traditional rules about sauces or mix, don't mix this, or this is what you're supposed to do with this sauce or that sauce or whatever. Um, Like I said, I don't really do that. I just, I mix more flavors than um, I think most. So a a little, maybe, maybe you would think a little bit out of the box. Mm. Um, but I think it's fun. I don't think that there, I, I would prefer not to categorize, you know, um, a region or, you know, I don't cook Italian. I don't cook Japanese. I don't cook New York. I just cook what's in front of me and what's season's best. And hopefully it tastes good. <laughs> mm, right. Well, that's how uh, the food culture in any place have been developing. 
and it will continue right. to develop. So yeah, that's mm-hmm. amazing. And uh, do you have any uh, signature dish to represent your? I don't know about signature dish, but there are some things that I that I tend to um, use often. Like I I make a dashi broth, but then I I add uh, Parmesan rinds mm. to cook for hours. Wow! Yeah, uh, it's really a, it's pretty. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty yummy, right. pretty tasty. Um, yeah, that makes sense, right? Because yeah. umami, um, all different kinds of amino acids. They multiply yeah. by merging together. So. Right. I have to try it. Exactly. <laughs> I'll try it. You should try it. And then you should try the other, the combination of, um, I, if you gr- like do a, uh, a frico, like a Parmesan, uh, but then I put a little bit, of, I put katsubushi mm. and I put nori, shredded nori and bake it. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. It's a hands down. It should work. And the same idea, right? <laughs> no, it, does, it tastes really good. But that's not something, you know, I remember doing cooking for my friends and, and they were just, you know, they couldn't believe it tastes, they said it tastes very delicious. But it was also as if I had just, you know, created the light bulb. Like it's not, it's not that, it's just, I think it just tastes good and right. that's why I do it. It's not really not to be pushing anybody's envelope. Right. It's just kind of, it's almost comforting. Well, in a it's, way. it makes sense, right? It's scientifically too. So, listeners, it's uh, dashi and uh, parmigiano wines, and also the other one is bacon and nori and bonito flakes to make some yeah. stocks. Okay. Um, all right. So, we'll take a quick break here. And when we come back, we'll discuss why Mary Beth decided to stay in Japan and what is special about Japanese food culture for her. So, please stay with us. This episode is brought to you by Brooklyn Ball Factory, a Japanese eatery and coffee shop at 95 Montrose Avenue in East Williamsburg. Brooklyn Ball Factory uses the best ingredients to make Japanese comfort food, like their bento boxes featuring meatballs, grilled veggies, Japanese fried chicken, or pork shabu shabu. Plus, visit Brooklyn Ball Factory's sister restaurants, Momo Sushi Shack, Samurai Papa, Samurai Mama, Bozu, and Kitare Shokudo. Learn more at brooklynballfactory.com. Welcome back. You're listening to Japan Eats Podcast in Life from a Studio in Bushwick, No, in Bushwick, Brooklyn, my apartment in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I'm your host, Akiko Tema. My guest today is Mary Beth Boyer, who is a former private chef for the U.S. Ambassador Caroline Kennedy from 2014 to 2017 in Tokyo. So, uh, so Ambassador Kennedy completed her mission in January 2017, but you decided to stay in Japan. So why is that? I had decided uh, probably maybe six or seven months prior to that Um and I had originally, I thought that I would stay at the embassy on a part-time basis. Um, I think we both expected Hillary Clinton to win, uh, which was unfortunate the way things <laughs> went down, I think, for everybody in the world. Wow. But um, so I, when I did leave the embassy, I left, we both left January 17th, the day Trump, Donald Trump started. And um I thought I'm not quite done with Japan. I felt that there was a lot more that I could learn and see and do. So I just looked at my options. I had no job. I had no visa. I had, you know, and tried to figure it out. I started taking more Japanese lessons. I reached out to some people um, and eventually figured it out and started doing a variety of different things so it's I mean I'm really happy that I stayed I felt like if I didn't it would have been much easier for me to pack up and leave go back to New York I mean much more uh would have been easier and definitely a uh a solid situation but I didn't want to do it and I'm really happy that I did Mm, it okay so what are your activities in Japan right now um 
Right now, I am doing a number of different things. I still, I'm still doing consulting. I've, I've been consulting for A and I, A and A airlines for a few years. Um, I've done consulting for Mitsui Fudasan. Um, I started, I did that right. I did that about two years ago for a really interesting project. Um, I lived on a Wadji Island (laughs) with an agricultural group for six months, Mm. the farm group. That was really ridiculously yeah. amazing um yeah i've never been to the island but it sounds like it's very kind of special like naturally it's, <laughs> it's beautiful i lived in the middle of a sweet potato farm yeah. and it was so bizarre actually <laughs> 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 but really beautiful um i mean i just kept there were moments where i moments of near madness, you know, <laughs> really, truly. <Wow. laughs> but then I thought, well, I'm never going to do this again. I, I, this is so far from New York. And so just enjoy it. And, and I did actually, it was pretty <laughs> great. Um, what else? So t- currently I'm like, I'm still, I'm still doing the ANA uh, consulting for, for them, which is really neat. I just launched a meal delivery service mm. called Noka Soul. Uh, we are, our plans are also to open up a fast, casual farm to bento concept restaurant, Mm. uh, in the fall. So that's pretty exciting. And then what else? I'm also where I've been doing, um, some consulting for Jetro Mm. and actually just before this horrible coronavirus, I had a group from Neiman Marcus come over and visit. Japan, we focused in Saga. I was hired by Jetro and Saga. Yeah, so Jetro, so, uh, well, this uh, is familiar with it, is a Japanese government organization who promotes uh, exports, imports, and businesses between Japan and other countries. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, they had hired me to, um, they basically asked me if I would help them uh, come up with some ideas to generate um, more distribution of artisanal products. Mm. So I thought about it. I went to Saga. I uh, explored a bunch of different places, selected some places that I thought were really amazing um, to kind of focus on. And anyway, long story short, um, Neiman Marcus, the head buyer for Epicure and the head of all the restaurants, uh, the VP of restaurants came over to visit and they loved it. So they loved Japan and hopefully there's going to be a Japan fair in 43 of their stores. Wow. That sounds amazing. Wow. So that's going to be really fun. Yeah. I hope, hopefully, I mean, you know, the world's, uh, is so crazy right now. Right. But, well, Japan um, is really in control in terms of uh, the coronavirus. So yeah. I know, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not yeah i know but we'll have to say yeah i mean it's great over here but it's not happening you know right. there's a lot that needs to happen in the u.s as you know right. um yeah so it well, sounds like a lot going on and it's, it's you know the, what's happening in japan in terms of the food world too so i'm curious uh based on your experiences um what is the the food trend among japanese people right now and i for example i heard that plant-based diet is not as popular as in the U.S. probably because they already have a lot of vegetables in their own Mm. food on a daily basis. So, yeah, yeah. what's the trend? I, you know, honestly, I I see more trends. I mean, there's there's definitely a little buzz about, there is a buzz about vegan, you know, but I don't think it's big. Like it's not, it's not like the States, but I do like, I have a, I have a friend who just wrote a book and there's a, there's, um, there's a little buzz about it. Um, I think more, I could certainly speak about trends like, uh, food halls, you know, that's definitely, there's two that just, just open up. There's one that's opening up in two weeks. Hmm. A tiny one. I don't know how. I mean, it's a tiny space. That's going to be tough. But um, that seems to be in the past several years. They 
have really grabbed onto that. Um, mm. Because food holes that concept. have been very popular in the States. Like, you know, the gourmet food halls, like uh, in New York mm. City. Is that kind of thing? Like, really? Yeah, no, I'm thinking, yeah, like a, like Time Out Cafe in Dumbo, for instance. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I know, can tell you the places in New York, and then I can tell you the places that are here that are kind of like, I can tell they've seen the places in New York, and then they try to do it here. Right. So I feel like that's the kind of trending. I think that there's, it seems to me that there's a, there's always a spotlight on what's happening in New York or what's, a, uh, you know, what they think, what, what seems to be kind of cool in New York or in the U.S. And then there may be something that um, attempts or tries to mimic it here. And sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not authentic at all. Right. But um, interesting. Mm, okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm i just very curious. That it sounds like a very Western idea to have who holds, but it's just the more communal idea. It's most like market concept in fancier buildings so that makes sense yeah but when i say food hall i mean you know so it's a number of different restaurants almost like a little not kiosk more than a kiosk but um a step above a kiosk so it's like chelsea market Mm. you know think about chelsea market but on a smaller scale right that kind of thing right or yeah yeah Mm. okay and uh Mm. So uh, you are one of the precious kind of professionals who have highly global perspective about food at this point. So what do you think uh, we should learn from the Japanese food culture and what Japanese should learn from other food cultures? Um, I think there's so much to learn from Japanese food. I think that there's, I think there's, I think it's almost, a sh- it's a real shame that, people don't know more about Japanese food or Japanese products. I, I think it's a real shame that um, it's the products aren't easily accessible mm. in cities like New York. I think, and I know that there are Japanese stores and you can get some stuff, but uh, a lot of the stuff is mass produced and I'd love to see a larger variety of the small artisanal products make their way right. into the hands of people. And I think that um, there needs to be kind of teaching and explaining what things are. And again, I think that they could do exceptionally well with Japanese products, even kind of maybe some funky artisanal products if they are brought to the consumer in a really um in a way that educates people about the product and in a way that uh eliminates the intimidation factor of how to use and what the products are Mm -hmm. because then people are will be much more apt to give it a try and embrace them and it's can, the same can be said for uh say u.s products here i actually did i worked for the california olive oil council for a while and it was the idea was to try to um introduce small batch olive oils to consumers here and people didn't know what to do with it you know if you don't really know that certain olive oils are not for sauteing they're just for finishing or things like that like you have to kind of explain that certain things can you know you basically you just have to teach people that um, how to use things and how not to be Keeping things in the, again, I think it's more about uh, thinking out of the box and making things, adapting things Mm. and different products into your comfort zone. Right. Well, I think now the information is available on the internet, but I know that like small Japanese artisanal small producers um, say go to, um, you know, the fancy food show in New York or those like very um, limited outlet they can 
introduce their yeah. products to the world. That's really frustrating, and I, I I'm very <laughs> frustrating. Yeah. Which is why I was so I'm so excited about the whole Neiman Marcus opportunity. If that really does, you know, I, I do hope that that um, works out because that in and of itself will be able to bring over. Um, some really fantastic products and put it on a platform that wouldn't have exist, wouldn't normally be there, right? you know, for those kind of consumers that um, will be okay with trying something a little new and different. Nice. So, I mean, I think that that's a pretty, ex- that ho- I really am very excited mm. about that. Oh, please do keep me posted. I'm very interested in that. I will. <laughs> I will. All right. So uh, what are your plans? My plan, my plans are to keep, keep on keeping on. You know? <laughs> it's sort of like I can't come back. I can't go back there. I would love to go. I, I mean, I, generally I go back to the, States I have I've been lucky enough to go back every summer this is going to be the first summer that I'm here um, for the duration so uh, you know I'm busy working on my new projects this um, it's busy I'm busy but I'm missing my family yeah. that's the bottom right. line originally so we were it's supposed hard. to record this episode in the studio so nothing didn't happen. exactly well that that wedding was canceled obviously and that but but I keep thinking oh well I'll be able to go in August and then it's like oh well then I'll be able to go in October mm-hmm. I don't know I mean it's it's depressing so it you know right that's for now I'm here Hopefully everybody stays healthy and this thing gets under control and then we can travel with a little more freedom. I mean, my plan is to stay in Tokyo, even pre pre Corona, the plan is to stay in Tokyo, stay in Japan, but working on these um, certain business opportunities that will allow me to spend more time in the States because I really, uh, do need to go back there more often right. well sounds like you're really becoming an ambassador by yourself so congratulations <laughs> i don't know about that i see it so, <laughs> yeah so where can we find your updates online uh well you could my website which is uh marybethbowler.com m-a-r-y-b-e-t-h-b-o-l-l-e-r Dot com and the company that we just started um, myself and my partner who's a Korean woman who owns five f and b uh, establishments in Seoul um, our business is called noka soul n o k a s o u l dot com okay great all right so yeah. uh Good luck with everything, and hopefully, eventually, we'll see you in person at the studio again. I hope so. Yeah. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, Mary Beth. So, listeners, if you have any questions or comments about the show or suggestions for show topics or guests, please contact us at japanese at heritageradionetwork.org or kikokatema.com. Japanese is always available at heritageradionetwork.org, iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify as a podcast. Engineer today is Matt Patterson, and thank you for listening. I'll see you next week. Japan Needs is powered by Simplecast. Thank you for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a non-profit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. 
just click on the beating heart at the top right of the homepage. Thank you for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.